Jacob sent messengers ahead to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. This is the moment of reckoning, when Jacob faces his past in order to secure his future. The brother he has wronged, the brother he's been running away from for 20 years, approaches, and with him 400 men. Does Esau come in a spirit of reconciliation and forgiveness, or for revenge? There's no way for Jacob to be sure. Naturally, Jacob is afraid. So he does what many people do when we are faced with a frightening or uncertain situation. Jacob tries to exert control, to maneuver and manipulate in order to achieve a favorable outcome for himself. First, he divides his entourage into two, into two camps, saying, if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, the other camp may yet escape. Then he prays to God, reminding God of the promise to give him offspring, as numerous as the sands of the sea. Surely having his whole family killed by Esau would not be a fulfillment of this promise. And finally, Jacob sends Esau gifts, hundreds of sheep and goats and cows, reasoning, if I propitiate him with presents in advance and then face him, perhaps he will show me favor. The younger brother who schemed his way into a birthright and a blessing is still scheming. But there's one small sign that Jacob might be ready to give up his manipulative ways. The next verse says, and so the gift went on ahead while he remained in camp that night. Rashi notes that Jacob sends this gift in an angry mood, that it should be necessary for him to do all this. Jacob is tired of plotting and strategizing, of trying to outsmart his brother, of trying so hard to win. He just might be tired enough of all the maneuvering that he's open to a new possibility, a new way of dealing with conflict. But first, Jacob tries to run away. Again, he brings all of his family and livestock across the river, but then he goes back across alone. The Midrash says he left some household items on the other side of the river and went back for them. But one commentator perceptively suggests that no, he was actually trying to run away to avoid the confrontation with Esau altogether. But there's no escape this time, as Jacob is met by a mysterious being who prevents him from leaving by wrestling with him all night. Famously, as dawn breaks, Jacob has prevailed, though with a sore hip, and has received a blessing and a new name. Your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with beings divine and human and have prevailed. It seems that this new name is a challenge to Yaakov, whose name means to supplant, to leave behind his manipulations and schemes and become Yisrael, the one who wrestles with himself and with God to face whatever challenges he meets with honesty and courage. So does Jacob, or Israel, rise to the occasion? Does he overcome his propensity for scheming and avoidance? Esau and Jacob meet at last, and we read, Esau ran to greet him, he embraced him, and falling on his neck, he kissed him, and they wept. Jacob humbles himself, addressing Esau as my Lord and urging him to accept the gifts he has sent. Esau eventually accepts the gifts and then invites Jacob to accompany him to his home. Jacob, however, hesitates, making an excuse that he can't travel too quickly for fear of harming his children and his flocks. Go on ahead, Jacob says. I'll meet you there. So Esau turns back to go home to Seir. And then Jacob turns the other way and ends up in Shechem, where he makes a home for himself. It's a bit of a letdown, I think. 
We tend to think of Jacob wrestling with the angel as a moment of transformation, an experience that changes Jacob permanently for the better. So while he may have gone on to have an honest and heartfelt reconciliation with Esau, he then goes right back to his old ways of deception, pretending to agree to visit Esau and Seir, but then running the other way. Jacob is still Jacob. That's why throughout the rest of the book of Genesis, he's sometimes called Israel and sometimes called Jacob. The transformation is never complete. The transformation is never complete because change, it turns out, is hard. Change requires the breaking of old habits and the learning of new ways of being. It can't happen overnight, even when that night involves an angelic visitor. Jacob's new name, Israel, reflects that he's engaging in the process of change, not that he has achieved it in any final sense. For the rest of Jacob's life, he will still struggle to deal fairly with his relatives, and he will still have a tendency to avoid difficult subjects. But he will also leave some of his deception behind and become perhaps less of a schemer. Jacob is a work in progress, just like each of us. We are B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel, which means, I'm sorry to say, that we are too meant to struggle. We're called upon to take up the same struggle as Jacob, the struggle to become more than we are, the struggle to grow and change. Jacob's wrestling match does not end in unequivocal victory or utter transformation, as we've seen. But right in the middle of the struggle, as Jacob and the mysterious being grapple with each other, something happens. The angel, seeing that Jacob is not giving up, says, let me go, for dawn is breaking. But he answered, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So the angel said, you sh your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with beings divine and human and have prevailed. Still face to face, arm in arm, the angel says, you have won, and offers Jacob his new name. And so, Jacob discovers that it is within the struggle that a blessing can be found. May we continue the struggle and through our wrestling find blessing as well. Shabbat shalom. <laughs>